Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel once again. I appreciate you taking the time out of your week to hang out with me. We're diving into another serial killer file, the case of the chessboard killer, Alexander Pachushkin. He was convicted of 48 murders, becoming the second most notorious murderer in Russia. So let's discuss this. Sit back, relax, and let's dive in. Alexander Pachushkin was born on April 9, 1974 in Moscow. His parents divorced very early on, so Alex didn't know his father, who abandoned the family when he was only one. Alex was a very sociable child and described as compassionate by family and neighbors alike. When Alex turned four, he suffered a minor head injury when he fell backwards off a swing. The chain reared back and struck him hard in his forehead, causing damage to the frontal lobe of his brain. The frontal lobe is associated with our behaviors, learning, and personality development. Alex's family speculated this injury caused a dramatic change in his demeanor. The once kind child now withdrawn and hostile against everyone. His life didn't get much easier once he started school. He suffered from ostracism and bullying, with classmates referring to him as the retard. This type of attention seemed to only cause Alex to lash out more. Alex's behavior and school conflicts caused his mother to take another approach. She transferred him to a school that specializes in children with intellectual disabilities. But Alex, too, found this traumatic. The school did more emphasizing on the disability rather than teaching the children to overcome their obstacles. His grandfather felt this school was harming him more than doing good, so he chose to take the boy under his wing. Alex was moved in with his grandfather, who not only found his grandson to be very intelligent, but also a gifted chess player. To provide him with a hobby outside of school, he began teaching him chess and Alex was a natural. His underlining aggression taught him to be a very combative player, and this would lead him to dominating any opponent he faced. He was often taken to Bitsa Park where he challenged older opponents winning every time. Chess provided Alex with an outlet for all of his pent-up anger. Tragedy though plagued his life. Alex's grandfather died when he was only a teenager and it was a huge blow. He was forced to move back to his mother's home and had to find his own means of coping. He did get a dog to help, and he would walk the dog at the same park he spent so much time with with his grandfather, but unfortunately the dog too would pass. With no alternatives, or so he felt, he began to heavily drink. He did continue to play chess at the park, but now the games included social drinking with his opponents. During this dark period, he also developed a strange hobby. When he came into contact with children who were alone, he would threaten them and record the whole interaction. He later confessed one time it went as far as him hanging a child upside down by his leg. He stated, quote, You are in my power now. I'm going to drop you from the window and you will fall 15 meters to your death. End quote. Thankfully, the child was unharmed. Alex watched these videos over and over as a way of reliving and putting himself in this position of power. But this became insufficient and Alex needed something more. He committed his first murder as only a teenager. While he was still a student, he was involved with a young lady named Olga. What Alex wasn't aware of is he had a romantic rival named Sergei, who was also after Olga's affection. Alex didn't handle this well, so he eliminates the competition by pushing him out of a window. 
Due to the surrounding circumstances, police ruled Sergei had taken his own life. Alex would later go on to say, quote, The first murder, it's like first love. It's unforgettable. End quote. His chess playing no longer seemed to control the aggression, so he chose to murder instead. In July 27, 1992, shortly after the first time, Alex decides to kill again. He invited his childhood friend Mikhail Odichuk to come on a killing expedition with him. He openly told Mikhail he wanted to kill someone, so together they began to look for a target. It became clear that Mikhail was not going to be a willing participant and wasn't serious about any of it, so Alex killed him instead. Alex found his niche. Taking the lives of others caused him to develop a god complex, and he needed to be on top. Around the same time, the Rostov Ripper, Andrei Chikatilo, was on trial for the murder of 52 victims. He was the most prolific serial killer the country had ever seen. Alex put himself in a dark competition with Andre, aiming to be more famous by taking more lives than his predecessor. Alex's infamous spree wouldn't begin until the early 2000s. And up until that point, he had lived a pretty quiet life. He lives in an apartment with his mother, about six minutes from Bitsa Park and he had a job at a nearby supermarket. During his free time, he would spend his time in the park playing chess with the homeless. But by 2001, he decided to start his mission and realized his new acquaintances were the perfect targets. Alex was able to relate to people and he made them feel comfortable, especially when vodka was supplied. He and the men would get along well, with Alex offering to show him his dog's grave as a reason to get them out of public eye. Once the men were completely inebriated, he snuck up behind them, striking them in the back of the head with a hammer. He always chose to strike from the back to avoid getting blood on his clothing. Then, regardless of whether he killed them or not, he pushed the bodies into the sewer system in the park. If they survive the blow to the head, they often drown after being thrown in the sewer. However, Alex wasn't getting any coverage for his crimes, and this is largely due to his victim choice. Sadly, homeless people tend to have few if any relatives and often go unnoticed. His numbers were increasing, yet no one was talking about the murders occurring in Bitsa Park. After several years of secretly killing homeless men, he decided to shake things up. In the spring of 2005, he began killing anyone, men, women, and children. He didn't care. He continued to kill in a similar fashion, but developed a signature. The holes left in their heads would be stuffed with a bottle of vodka or a stick he had found. He also no longer chose to hide the bodies. He just left them in the open, hoping they would be discovered. And it didn't take long for this to happen. Bodies were popping up within and near Bitsa Park, with the first being that of 31-year-old Nikolai Vorbiov on October 15, 2005. The following month, another of a 63-year-old man. Two weeks later, Vladimir Dudikin, and the following week, another body. By December, seven bodies had been discovered, and none of the bodies showed signs of robbery. Police did notice that they all shared similar injuries. From this sign, it was clear a serial killer was on the loose, with the media dubbing him the Bitsa Beast. This was no longer in the jurisdiction of the Moscow police. The sector theorized the killer could be a former or current patient of the nearby psychiatric hospital. The facility often gave special passes to the patients who showed curing and the task force felt maybe they escaped and were now using the park as a hunting grounds. 
There was no clear evidence that this was the case, but after questioning and interviewing patients and staff, no one seemed to fit as the suspect and this lead was dropped. Investigators were now back to square one. Officers were sent to the park to question anyone suspicious, but again, nothing came from these efforts. By the end of February, more bodies, and the count was now up to 12. The next body wasn't discovered until April, but Alex threw investigators for a loop when the first female victim, Larissa Klugina, was discovered. Everything they thought they knew about the murderer was null and void. The body count continued to stack, but the end was in sight. Alex slipped up. Two months later, in June of 2006, another woman was discovered. The body of 36-year-old Marina Moskalova was discovered in Bitsa Park, but this time was much different. Marina had a 15-year-old son who grew suspicious when his mother did not return home. She left a note with the boy indicating she was going out with her boyfriend, Sasha, and left a number she could be reached at. Police were able to trace this phone number back to 32-year-old Alexander Pachushkin. Now, this may seem like a dead end since she was with a man named Sasha. However, in Russian, the name Alexander is often shortened to Sasha. Alex was questioned with him denying any involvement, stating the two were just co-workers. Unfortunately for him, this alibi crumbled once police discovered inside of Marina's coat pocket was a metro ticket. The ticket prompted a search of the surveillance tapes at the station. Among the pixels, hand in hand with Marina, was Alexander. Police had enough to bring him in. Alex continued to deny everything, but he eventually came around, confessing that on June 13th, he invited Marina out for a picnic. After being alone with her for a few hours, he decided to take the woman's life. On June 16, 2006, Alexander was arrested for the murder of Marina. Now that he was apprehended, Alex decided it was his time to shine. During a televised confession, Alex declared that he had killed 61 victims. This was a big shock for police because they realized the Bitsa maniac was sitting in front of them. While in custody, his apartment was searched for more evidence to support his claims. Here they discovered his strange trophy system that represented his goals. Alex had a chessboard which contained a number on almost every square but three. He explained he intended to kill one person for every square on the chessboard, and once he completed this task, he would go on to kill indefinitely. Also found was a hammer Alex claimed was the murder weapon. Alex explained his actions, stating, quote, For me, life without killing is like life without food for you. End quote. Alex needed to kill. He was motivated by the power and thrill he felt from deciding who lived and died. Alex was very forthcoming with his confession. He led investigators to scenes and performed reenactments of the murders which were filmed. He showed great detail and took pride in what he'd done, showing no remorse. The only forensic evidence produced in some of the bodies was bits of plastic which came from the handle of the hammer found. It took investigators a while to connect Alex with the bodies. Bits of Park contains 2,700 acres of woods. He also claimed to have dumped at least 40 bodies in the sewers, which he actually tried to blame police, stating they could have found them sooner if they were actively looking. Alex did confess on some occasions his victims did escape, and the lack of police intervention allowed him to continue to kill. One in particular is the case of 19-year-old Maria Vivrovicheva. In February of 2002, she had made plans to meet with Alex to purchase a camera at the park. 
Alex assaulted her and shoved her into the sewer, but thankfully she did not die. Maria was trapped for 20 hours but managed to climb out. She was hospitalized due to the injuries and because she was pregnant at the time. Police showed up and took a statement, but felt it was nothing to pursue, despite the woman having the name of her assailant. They dropped the case altogether. If the lead had been followed, police could have stopped the chessboard killer before he really began. After compiling everything they could, investigators were able to formally charge Alexander with 48 murders and 3 attempted murders. He underwent psychiatric evaluation where Moscow's Serbsky Institute declared him mentally sane to stand trial. His trial started on September 13, 2007. Alex was locked in a glass cage for his and everyone else's safety during the trial. He enjoyed being the center of attention despite his circumstances. During the trial, Alex made the remark, quote, in all cases, I kill for only one reason. I killed in order to live, because when you kill, you want to live. I felt like the father of all these people, since it was I who opened the door for them to another world." End quote. The trial lasted for a total of six weeks, with the jury only taking three hours to deliberate. Alex Pachinski was convicted of 48 murders and three attempted murders, becoming Russia's second worst serial killer. After the verdict, he argued he should be charged with more since he had killed 61 victims in total. Alex felt it was unfair to forget about those 13 victims. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole, since this was the highest punishment he could receive under Russian law. In 1996, Russia instituted a moratorium on capital punishment, making it illegal to sentence criminals to death. They also added that the first 15 years of his sentence would be spent in solitary confinement. His current home is Siberia's Polyernia Sova facility, one of Russia's worst penitentiaries. Behind bars, he's become somewhat of a celebrity, receiving tons of fan mail and even a love interest. In 2014, a woman only identified as Natalia proclaimed her love for him. According to her, they communicated frequently and she was proud of him. She believed it was love at first sight, despite the pair never actually meeting. In 2016, Alex proposed to her, but due to the Russian prison system, they have been barred from corresponding. But apparently, Natalia remains devoted. Alexander is still currently in solitary confinement, with next year being his projected release. And another serial killer file comes to a close. We have another case here involving a head injury. What do you guys think about the correlation of serial killers, well, murderers in general, and head injuries? Leave your thoughts and comments down below and we can chat about it. Also, if you found this video informational, consider giving it a thumbs up to let YouTube know you want more. And lastly, if you're not subscribed, please consider doing so because we would love to have you under the ash tree. Shout out to Brittany who provided our subject matter this week. I always love and appreciate this audience's input and suggestions because you guys rock. Thank you all for being so very supportive of the channel. And as always, I will see you in the next one. Bye, friends.